when I talk about this statistic, I get frightened. Larry Fink says that this statistic frightens him, and this is why he believes in Bitcoin. In the year 2000, the U.S. deficit was $8 trillion. Today, it's $34 trillion. So 23 years later, we increased our deficit by $26 trillion. So for the first 230 odd, 40 years, we increased our deficit to $8 trillion. And in the last 23 years, we, went, we, we increased it by $26 trillion. I think that speaks volumes of what's happening in our in our in our country today. BlackRock has now put themselves on record saying Bitcoin overwhelmingly is our number one priority for our investors. Interesting quote. BlackRock says what we're seeing is that investors, our investors, investors in general are resoundingly choosing BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF IBIT for their Bitcoin access. That's a combination of investors who are totally new to Bitcoin, plus those who have held exposure to Bitcoin in different forms historically. For our clients, Bitcoin is overwhelmingly the number one priority. And then a little bit Ethereum. Now, last time you were on the show, you also mentioned that there is going to be one blockchain ecosystem that rules them all. And you believe that is Ethereum. Why do you think that is? It's really interesting when you kind of peel back the curtain and see what's happening to Bitcoin and Ethereum on exchanges. The downtrend in Ethereum and Bitcoin reserves on exchanges persists with a minor uptick for Ethereum. Meanwhile, Bitcoin's supply decline steepens, likely driven by increased ETF acquisition. But what's interesting is that there's less Ethereum than Bitcoin on exchanges. Guys, smash the like button. Let's get this information out there to as many people as possible. Most people don't realize BlackRock is going to own more Bitcoin than Michael Saylor soon. Give me an example of something you can own $100 million of where you can take personal custody of it and where you can actually move it anywhere on Earth and where even if I hold a gun to your head, I can't take it from you. And the only thing we've ever figured out that you can do that with is Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin is like... Um, it keeps everybody honest. The optionality to do this means that all you've got to do is find one bank in Singapore that'll treat you better than the bank in New York or London or Tokyo, and then you can move it in a half an hour for five bucks. And what happens next? The bank in New York thinks, well, I guess we can't screw these guys over because in, they'll just move it to Singapore. And the guys in California say, well, I can't, I can't just tax all the Bitcoin in California. It'll move to Wyoming. It'll move to Singapore. It'll move to Malta. And at the end of the day, you could tell everybody go fuck themselves. So yeah, Bitcoin looking incredibly bullish. Just give it time. The conversation around Bitcoin nowadays is 100% ETF devoted. Seems like just because there's so much demand coming from that ETF wrapper, because it's so easy for these big players and institutions to buy via the ETFs. And so many have yet to get onboarded or in the process of still being able to get onboarded and buying and getting their first 1%, then 2%, then 3%. Wisdom Tree gains approval to purchase spot Bitcoin ETFs for its $206 million and $117 million funds. Certainly the biggest unknown right now is Ethereum. Like we see what's going on behind the scenes, BlackRock launching a tokenized asset fund on Ethereum already seeded with $100 million in USDC. We have different expert analysts and institutions putting out detailed reports with Ethereum price predictions. Standard Charter Bank is predicting Ethereum could hit $8,000 by the end of 2024 and $14,000 possibly by the end of 2025. What do you think? Like Larry Fink has already laid out his vision for Ethereum and it seems his vision is quickly becoming a reality. I believe the next generation for markets, the next generation for securities will be, will be tokenization of securities. And if we could have that distributed ledger that we know every beneficial owner Every beneficial seller, we all have our, our, our code right. of who's buying, who's selling, instantaneous settlement. I see value in having an Ethereum ETF. As I said, these are just start stepping right. stones towards tokenization. And I really do believe this is where we're going to be going. We have the technology to tokenize today. If you want to talk about, think about this. If you had a tokenized right. security and you have a tokenized identity, right. you, Andrew, 
the moment you buy or sell an instrument, it's known. It's an, on a general ledger right. that is all created together. Um, you want to talk about issues around money laundry and all that. This eliminates all corruption by having a tokenized system. Hey, LA locals, make sure you come out for the roast of Altcoin Daily, April 11th, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. in Santa Monica. Special two for $40 ticket sale going on right now. Linked below. Get your tickets to this. Come hang out with us. Come have a laugh. It's going to be great. Are you more bullish on Bitcoin right now or Ethereum right now? I feel like we've reached a point in the cycle where it's pretty obvious how bullish Bitcoin is. Bitcoin could be at 100K, 200K, 300K in just a matter of a year or two. It's possible. Like I said earlier, Ethereum is a big unknown. Now, to this man right here, Paul Brody of Ernst & Young. Ernst & Young is one of the big four accounting firms. These guys are bigger than MicroStrategy. Paul Brody heads up the blockchain arm of Ernst & Young. He's more bullish on Ethereum. He thinks an Ethereum ETF is on the horizon, but he's interested in Ethereum not just as an investment, but also as the ultimate super DAP platform. Before we talk about the ETF, here he explains how big a deal Ethereum's last upgrade was for using Ethereum. There's two things we're taking away from Zenkan. The first is that like all these other previous Ethereum upgrades, they did this flawlessly, no drama, no downtime. It's kind of really amazing when you think about it, right? They moved several hundred billion dollars of financial infrastructure from one version to the next without a hiccup. So that's the first thing, which is just the maturity of the organization, the people, the engineers behind it. The second thing though, is that first the merge that happened, you know, about, I think it was 12 months ago, and now Duncan, they are both milestones in terms of driving down the cost of transactions. And Denkin in particular built on the merge, and now we're seeing some of the transaction costs on Ethereum, they are falling well below a penny. Some of them were allowed down five cent, down to five cents previously, but now we're below a penny. And this may not seem like a big deal, but particularly for industrial customers, you're talking about, I've got clients, for example, they want to do a million or more transactions a day for a single product line to manage their supply chains. So when you start to talk about those volumes, really, really low transaction costs are extremely important. And what we're seeing now is Ethereum has just become the default choice for any kind of digital token, any kind of tokenized asset. Even if it's not a cryptocurrency, if it's a real world asset, gold, oil, you name it, it's going to be on the Ethereum ecosystem. But of course, the big unknown is the BlackRock Ethereum ETF. Paul Brody thinks it's going to happen. He thinks that's going to usher in a whole new era for Ethereum. Actually, listen to what he says. Another development we're following, obviously a lot of asset managers have applications pending before the SEC for spot Ether ETF. Some of those asset managers include BlackRock, Van Eck, and Grayscale. And last time you were on the show on Crypto World back in September, you were optimistic, it seemed, that these applications will in fact get approved. And you noted that if they do in fact get approved, there will be a tidal wave of institutional money that flows into the space. So are you still feeling optimistic that these Ether ETFs will get approved and what will change if they do get approved? So I'm very optimistic. The experience with the Bitcoin ETFs has been very positive. There's the same kind of thing pending with the Ethereum ones that are gonna be just as positive. What is gonna happen eventually, and I'm a little surprised it hasn't happened yet, is that people don't treat Bitcoin and Ethereum differently. They both see them as cryptocurrencies, but really Bitcoin has become the kind of digital gold. It is a crypto asset, whereas Ethereum is really shaping up as a crypto computing platform. And so if you want to hold an asset just for appreciation, people are going to buy Bitcoin. If you want to invest in a computing platform for financial services and business operations, then Ethereum and ETH in particular is, is going to be your choice. But the Ethereum Foundation is under investigation by the SEC. The SEC is seemingly still trying to label Ethereum as an unregistered security. Ernst & Young's Paul Brody, the Michael Saylor of Ethereum, explains why Ethereum is still a buy. So two things. I mean, first of all, there's been all these reports, but there haven't been a lot of facts. And, and I could be wrong because I haven't seen the latest data, but I don't think the SEC themselves have actually said anything on this topic officially. You know, I feel like in the Bitcoin discussion, first of all, they delayed the Bitcoin conversation a couple of times. They, they allowed the maximum timeline. And secondly, there were always rumors flying around. I think it would be premature to like worry too much about that. But obviously, even if Ethereum is categorized as a security, it doesn't change the fact that it is an extremely valuable uh, platform. 
And we've already worked with a lot of clients to be able to use the Ethereum blockchain without ever holding ETH. You can just transact entirely in US dollars. So I don't think it will be an obstacle to the adoption of Ethereum as a computing platform. And it certainly won't be an issue in Europe or Asia, where a lot of other countries have regulatory frameworks that support securities and allow them. So yeah, I think Bitcoin is a buy right now for sure. But I also think do not sleep on Ethereum. And there's a reason I call this man the Michael Saylor of Ethereum, because he thinks the Ethereum blockchain is the blockchain that will rule them all. Subscribe to Altcoin Daily. We post one video every day, keeping you informed. See you tomorrow. Now, last time you were on the show, you also mentioned that there is going to be one blockchain ecosystem that rules them all. And you believe that is Ethereum. Why do you think that is? So Ethereum is dominant in the same way that things like Microsoft and Windows are. It's not that, and I always hate getting into the discussion of which platform is better because there are always better platforms. Technology keeps moving along. However, what happens is we tend to pick a platform that's widely adopted and it gets a lot of momentum. And we see that in computing platforms all the time, right? Windows is the world's desktop operating system. IBM has the dominant share, is the 100% share of the mainframe business. Ethereum is, if you think of Ethereum as a computing platform, this idea that we would have a single dominant platform makes a lot of sense. And if you look at the ecosystem right now, for example, there's quite a few challengers to Ethereum, but Ethereum itself now contains more than 40 layer two networks. So the real competitive action, the real innovation is now happening inside the Ethereum ecosystem, not in competition with it. So that the momentum has really changed in terms of where the market focus is. And I think that is actually really good for the development of applications because people are no longer saying, which network should I be on? They're going to be on Ethereum. And then the question is, what application should I deploy? What layer two network should I use?